G'day everyone, oh, Eagles fans, whoever's clicked on this video, you're all welcome. Um, here we are again talking about the 2023 draft. We're currently in between day one and day two, and um, I have done my thoughts on, on how day one went, and I've also done my mock draft for how day two went. So assuming you're watching this video before the start of the second round, that's worth checking out. So um, yeah, I've done a mock draft, but today I just want to focus on specifically this pick at the West Coast Eagles hold because this one is an intriguing one and uh, it could go a number of different ways and I am really unsure which way it will go. So I guess we're just going to talk about uh, the options the West Coast have and what we want to see out of this particular pick. Before I get into it, if you don't mind, just quickly subscribe to the channel. That'll be much appreciated. Thanks. Oh, you didn't quite hit it. Oh, yeah, cool. sweet, thanks. Okay, so to reflect on day one quickly, obviously getting Harley Reid is a massive win for the club and a huge inclusion and a best 22 player from day dot, you think. He's good enough and developed enough to improve our list or a best 22 immediately. I don't want to focus too much on Harley Reid in this video because I am yeah, a time crunch. I got to get this video out. Uh, but also that just involves or it requires a video in its own right. So we'll talk about um, our draft hall and reflect on it a little bit more after the fact. Um, but with this selection, um, you know, obviously, well, we saw in day one, the Eagles tried and failed to trade for uh, GWS's pick eight, it became, and select Daniel Curtin. So uh, this one had pros and cons either way. And uh, I must admit, like going into the day, I got a little bit excited at the prospect of adding Reed and Curtin in the same top 10, um, top 10 picks. We haven't had too many top 10 picks, I think, between Jinbi and Gaff. So what's that? Nine years. No, sorry, it's 13 years. If I got that right? I have, I have. Yeah, that was our last top 10 pick, Andrew Gaff before Ruben Jinbi. So to add two in a subsequent draft would have been very juicy. It would, however, come at the cost of a future first round pick. And uh, I've laid out the pros and cons of that because that could be pick one next year. So we'll hold on to that for now. But what missing out on Daniel Curtin has done has created a little bit of, um, maybe it hasn't created pressure, but if had we got Daniel Curtin, it would have taken off pressure for us to necessarily select at all with our next selection. And that's the situation I think we're now in because looking at day two and the, and the amount of talent left, particularly key defenders, there's, uh, there's three that come to mind straight off the bat uh, who are all available. Ollie Murphy, I'm surprised that he's still available. Apparently he didn't test well at the combine. That is reportedly, or it's been suggested um, in you know informal circles that, that that's why he slid. So I'm not too sure what's gonna happen there because I would have been happy to take Ollie Murphy. I've been talking him up this entire draft period. 200 centimeter key defender, that's, uh, that's a nice attribute to have because it offsets him a little bit from Bazo. Um, Harry Edwards is also 200 centimeters. Harry Edwards has had so much injury in the last couple of years and he hasn't really developed to the point where I'm happy to say, no, we've got our back line sorted. So Ollie Murphy presents as a really good option there. Zach Ostelski is another athletic key defender I really like. Um, whether or not he can last with our next pick, pick 40, that's another question I don't really know. I would have probably bet against it. Um, but also there's the fact that, again, are we in a position to run the risk? Because I don't think we want to walk out of this draft with four or five selections and them all being non-key position players. And I think this particular pick is right in the mix for where a lot of good tools are about to go, in my opinion. So I've men mentioned two, Zach Ostelski and Murphy. The other one's Ari Schoenmaker. He was considered a potential first round talent. Um, linked to North Melbourne specifically, and uh, I think the Crows as well, other clubs looking for key defenders in this year's draft. And he's gotten through them all. And Sean Maker, to me, is probably my least preferred out of those three. But he may easily be the one we pick. I have seen him linked to us in media circles. So think about Sean Maker, a little bit smaller. He's 194 centimeters and a bit more of a playmaking defender. And he sets up play with his really good kick. Really long kick as well. So then he does have a point of difference, and I would I would get over it very quickly if that's who we picked. But I do kind of think it's got to be one of those three. And I, I'm just kind of scanning the draft board here. I mean, suppose we could go for a key forward option. There's guys like Luke Lloyd. Um, there's guys like Archer Reed still there. Riley Weatherall, maybe. Um, and I'd be okay with a key forward. But I do think a key back is a more pressing need, and there's some more obvious options there. So I think this is a really interesting pick for us and I am unsure where to go with it because I think Zach Ostelski probably on draft boards not so much my own opinion but draft boards is probably the ranked the third out of all three but he's the local um, but he does have that athletic profile to suggest that he could really develop big time 
So Zach Kostelski is one option and I'd be very happy with that. Ollie Murphy, if we back him in, I'm also happy with that. And that's probably my preference, but I really do think it's got to come from one of those three. We were pretty unlucky to miss out on other two other targets that we got really close to making it to this pick in Ashton Moyer and Lance Collard. They went the two picks before us, which burns a little bit. You know, you win the wooden spoon and uh, your pick comes in, your second pick comes in at pick 30. We did just walk away from the draft with the best, you know, generational talent thus far this draft system has seen. So I can't complain too much. But yeah, it's a bit unfortunate to miss out on two guys that I think we probably were looking at realistically. There was clear links there. Um, but, you know, if it forces us to pick a tall here, then I think then that gives us some balance, which also is a big plus for us. And then it also frees us up to, to pick potentially smalls. I don't think we necessarily need to pick another one, um, another tall in this draft. Mitch Edwards actually is another contender for this selection that I wouldn't lose any sleep if we did pick him up here because I do think people are sleeping on him with regard to his talent. I think he's a super athletic player compared to a bit to Tim English in terms of um, athleticism, but also Max Gorn in the way he sort of drops back into defense and, and plays, um, plays smart football in the same way that Gorn does. So again, a very raw prospect. He's 89 kilos and he's about 206 centimeters, but I would be very, very pleased if we did pick him. Because, um, you know, I've talked about it before. Yes, we've kind of, we've got four rucks on the list, but in terms of long-term talent, I don't think any of them have the potential to be an All-Australian ruck, to be honest. Um, I do like the look of Barnett early days, though, early days. So if it's Edwards, I don't lose any sleep over it. I think we do still need to add a key back. If we can somehow snag Edwards at this pick and then Zach Ostelski at the third pick, that's a dream result. Um, or flip it the other way. But some other mids, and and I I do do this in my phantom draft, but I think at 40 and what I think will be 49 and then potentially our final pick. A couple of talents that I like the look of that we've been linked to. Well, one in particular is uh, Will Lawrence and uh, he's an outside midfielder from uh, Victoria. And I think with his class and style, I think the Eagles are crying out for some polish. I think if we draft another midfielder, it's got to be someone with some outside game. We've just got Jinby Hewitt and Reed. We've packed out the inside midfield. I think we need some outside class to support Chesser in that next wave. Um, you know, there's talk of Hoff and Bergeel potentially being wingmen. At the moment, they're playing as defenders. So I think we can still look to add some outside class. Joel Frazier is another one um, who's quite a dynamic player. Six foot three, hits the scoreboard, athletic, strong, takes grabs. Um, he's different to what we have on the list already. So those those are two players that I like the look of. And Kay Delarue as a forward mid um, with the latest selection and is another name I'm looking out for. I do think we'll probably um, end up with Oscar Hein Baston, our next generation academy talent, either tomorrow or the following day. If he goes completely undrafted, then uh, we can, I think, just rookie list him or list him as a cat B. I, I, it's one of those two. I can't remember. So if we're already potentially getting a smaller defender in Oscar Heim Baston, there's also Cohen Livingston in the Next Generation Academy talent who I don't think will get taken in the draft, but we can probably rookie list. That's another key forward prospect. So if we're getting a key forward and a small defender, then I think we probably look midfield and forward um, smaller types outside of a key defender. One other player we've been linked to is Archie Roberts. You know, I won't lose sleep if we do pick him at uh, our first selection on day two because stylistically, I think he suits what we're looking for. He's got the skills, he's got the pace and can probably play early. But I do double down on my belief that I think we need to go tall with this particular pick and we'll probably miss out on Archie Roberts. But they may be thinking a very, very different situation. And I'm hoping maybe, you know, we go with our gut, we take whoever we think is best at the first pick, even if it's not at all. And hopefully we just pluck a random key position player out of the Waffle Colts competition that has played five games and then he ends up being a star. That's that's our ideal result. But I think we do have a knack of picking talls late. I think we've shown that in the past. Jack Williams is performing way above expect- expectation. He was like pick 57. Um, even Harry Edwards out of the rookie draft. You know, Injuries aside, I think in terms of talent identification, we did a really good job there. So yeah, I'm hoping for some sort of late gem um, it was interesting looking back on the Eagles. Uh, they released a video clip of them working in the draft room in the 2022 draft. And they were talking about Noah Long. And they were the footage shows of them planning to get the pick to take uh, Noah Long, which I don't think we traded for it. So it's a bit confusing, but it um, doesn't matter. They were definitely talking about taking Noah Long. 
And somebody said, where do we have him? And they said in the early 20s. And this really shows how subjective the draft system is because uh, Noah Long being rated in the top 20s is obviously very different to what everyone else thought. So it's just an interesting insight as to how, again, subjective and diverse the rankings are of uh, various players. So we might see some results tomorrow we're not expecting. But I'm hoping that I can just relax a little bit about getting a key defender once we have one on the list. But as always, guys, I welcome your comments in the comment section below. I'll do my best to reply to them, but I, uh, I'm a busy man at the moment, busy time of the year. But it's exciting. I love this time of year and uh, it's great to share it all with you. So thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.